our work. Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions. Question one, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government when the Crown Office was first notified of the allegations of mortgage fraud against Christopher Hales. Lord Advocate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Crown has made clear on a number of occasions recently, the case of Christopher Hales was first brought to its attention by the Law Society of Scotland at a meeting on the 18th of December 2014. Can I thank the Lord Advocate for that response? We understand that the Law Society told the Crown Office informally in December 2014 about the Christopher Hales case, then in April 2015, and then formally in July 2015. Does he believe that there should be an investigation into the process of communication between the Law Society and the Crown Office, given that additional opportunities for alleged mortgage fraud could have arisen due to the delay? Will he order such an inquiry? And can I also ask the Lord Advocate, when he instructed the police to investigate, um, and if, as we understand it, was within six days of receiving the report, has he set a deadline for the police to submit a report to the Crown Office? And if this is not the case already, will he consider so doing? Lord Advocate. Uh, thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Uh, there's a number of questions uh, in uh, have been asked of me. Dealing firstly with the, the last question, uh, it is correct to say that on the 3rd of July 2015, uh, the police, Police Scotland, were instructed uh, to investigate uh, the allegations which were the subject of the Scottish Solicitors Disciplinary Tribunal. Uh, the report was received on that day, considered by Crown Office, and six days later, I think it was the 9th, uh, that formal instructions uh, were issued to the police. I can't set a timescale for it because these are complex matters. But what I can say uh, is that uh, the Serious and Organised Crime Division of the Crown Office are in regular contact with both the, the Law Society uh, and indeed the Police Scotland who are dealing with this matter to monitor progress and to assist in a number of legal matters which have arisen. Uh, uh, as a result of the investigation. In relation to uh, whether I uh, think that there should be an inquiry or whether I uh, should order an inquiry, firstly, I don't have the power to order an inquiry, and secondly, I don't think that there should be an inquiry, and let me explain why. Let me just take you through the timeline uh, of uh, interaction between uh, the Crown Office or the Serious and Organised Crime Division of the Crown Office and the Law Society. There are quarterly meetings at which uh, a, quite a large number of matters are discussed, including um, issues of whether or not the Law Society will make a referral in relation to a solicitor who has been struck off or is the subject of a disciplinary finding made against them. On the 18th of um, uh, December, uh, we, the Crown Office were first advised uh, of uh, the issue. Uh, the Crown Office was advised that the uh, matter was under consideration of a referral to the Crown. Uh, the Crown noted the findings of the Scottish Solicitors Disciplinary Tribunal uh, and uh, also noted that neither uh, the clients uh, nor the properties involved were named uh, at the meeting. Uh, the next uh, time it was discussed, as you rightly said in your supplementary question, was in April uh, of this year, the 28th to be precise. Again, the issue was raised uh, and uh, it was noted that um, it was still under consideration um, a, a referral by the Law Society to the Crown. Uh, again, neither uh, the clients nor the properties were intimated at that time. Now, following these meetings, um, the Crown was in contact with the Law Society uh, to discuss uh, what needs to be obtained, what evidence um, needs to be obtained, what files, who has them, and a whole host of other matters. Now, it's not, I don't think it would be productive, given the fact there's a live investigation, to get into these details. And I would hope that Jackie Bailey would accept from me uh, that preparatory work was undertaken with the Law Society to deal with the matter 
if and when there was a formal uh, referral. Uh, as indicated, um, the referral was made on the 3rd of July 2015. We were advised on the 1st of July 2015 by the Law Society uh, that they required to get authorisation from the Guarantee Fund Subcommittee to formally refer the case to the Crown Office. Now, that is a Law Society procedure. Uh, and you must understand what we are dealing with here. We are dealing with a criminal investigation at which a person's liberty uh, could be in jeopardy. So these things cannot be dealt with quickly or by word of mouth. There is a process. Uh, and uh, that process was carried out by the Law Society and authorisation uh, was given for a referral by the Guarantee Fund Subcommittee to refer the case. Once that authorisation was given, uh, the referral was made on the 3rd of July 2015. When I say referral, uh, uh, that is a formal referral from the, the Law Society of Scotland. It contains a whole load of uh, information which the Crown would need. And, of course, the Crown has been working or in contact with the Law Society in relation to matters um, in anticipation of the referral uh, being made. Uh, as indicated, um, the referral, I think, was received on the 3rd of July, which is a Friday. And I think it was formally referred to the police, or the police were instructed the following uh, Thursday. The first time that the Crown was made aware of the clients uh, and the properties uh, was on the 3rd of July 2015. Uh, the Crown was not aware of the clients and the properties prior to that. Uh, the, there would be issues of client confidentiality and data protection, but of course that's not my problem or that was not my issue. That's a matter for the Law Society in their dealings with the matter. But I can assure you, and I've spoken to the persons at the meeting, and I've also uh, had sight of the notes of the meeting, uh, the first time that the Crown was made aware of the identity of the clients and the properties involved was the 3rd of July 2015. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Lord Advocate for that response? I think you know, the public would probably not understand why it takes more than a year for the disciplinary tribunal to notify the Crown Office. And our concern should always be that vulnerable people in that intervening period could have been caught up and exploited in alleged mortgage fraud. But it would appear from press reports that there are not one but three lawyers that have faced disciplinary action by the Law Society. In all, in all cases, there has been one common denominator. Was the Crown Office aware at any stage of these additional cases and had connections been made by the Law Society that were then notified to the Crown? And given the seriousness of the allegations, has the Crown Office taken any steps through the proceeds of Crime Act to freeze the assets of any of those who might be implicated? In well, dealing with the, the, the last point in relation to the proceeds of crime, uh, no, the Crown has not uh, yet uh, taken steps under the proceeds of crime legislation. I think that's premature for that to, to, to be done uh, or considered. But the Crown, uh, in any criminal investigation, uh, always has uh, at the forefront uh, potential proceeds of crime. But there has to be established criminality uh, before that can uh, be embarked upon. Uh, secondly, in relation to uh, other solicitors uh, who may or may not be involved, and I have to be very careful about what I say, what I can tell you uh, is that in relation to the referral on the 3rd of July 2015, uh, as far as I'm aware, and I read the referral this morning, and I'll check it uh, after uh, these proceedings uh, are concluded, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's only one solicitor which is referred to. Uh, however, uh, you have placed me on notice, and I will certainly make inquiries uh, into that matter. Margaret Fraser. Uh, thank you. In what circumstances would the Crown Office ask Police Scotland to investigate uh, any other person connected with the solicitor subject to the Law Society's judgment? Lord Advocate. Uh, I gave some consideration to that because uh, I think it's a, a highly relevant question. Um, the referral to Police Scotland is in relation to the solicitor who was the subject of the Scottish Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal finding. 
uh, and the police uh, have been instructed to investigate the property transactions relating to that finding, resulting in the solicitor being struck off. Police Scotland have a duty uh, in any criminal investigation to follow the evidence uh, and where that takes them. So if, during a police investigation, evidence arises that other persons have been involved in criminality and fraud or whatever uh, crime uh, that the police have uncovered evidence uh, of, then uh, Police Scotland, uh, I have uh, complete faith in them that they will act and do the right thing, as will the Crown. Thank you. Question number two, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the claim in the report, affordable housing need in Scotland, that the need for affordable housing is double what is being delivered. Minister, Margaret Burgess. Presiding officer, we will of course consider the findings of the report. We've a, we are already delivering a huge boost to affordable housing provision across Scotland by investing over £1.7 billion to build 30,000 affordable homes during the lifetime of this Parliament. That is a significant achievement at a time of cuts to our capital budgets. We want to do more. We want to increase and accelerate our ambitions for Scotland's housing and to continue to do so in an integrated and collaborative way. Our current target of 6,000 affordable homes a year is absolutely not the limit of our ambition. And in the last seven years, we have delivered 19 per cent more affordable homes than the previous administration. Statistics published this morning also show that provisional local authority capital expenditure in housing has increased by 7.1 per cent from 2013-14 to 2014-15. This is 28% of the total capital expenditure for 2014-15. Jim Hume. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, she unfortunately mentioned the previous coalition. I'm afraid the figures are wrong. The start-ups for the, the year of 2006-07 were five, over 5,500 in that, uh, the last year, whereas the start-ups in this last financial uh, year were just over 3,500. But putting that aside, the report which is published by the three of Scotland's leading housing organisations reassessed the target that is needed to tackle Scotland's housing pricing and is now calling for at least 12,000 affordable homes to be built each year for the next five years. Uh, so, in her considerations, will the government be, when will the government be in a position to commit to reassessing its targets and bring them closer to the realistic needs to solve this crisis? Minister. Um, as I indicated in my answer, um, the, the, the our current target is not the limit of our ambition and we want to do more and we are working across the sector with stakeholders across the sector to just do that. But I would remind the member that given uh, the, the falling budgets that this Scottish Government has had, we have built more houses over the last seven years than the previous administration. We know we need to build more and we're working hard to do that. And he can be assured that housing remains a priority for the Scottish Government. Jim Hume. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Director of uh, Shelter Scotland said that progress is nowhere near meeting the level on demand. That's a quote. His quote. Homes for Scotland says that housing production is still 40 per cent lower than in 2009. Despite a record population and growing number of households, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations said that by tackling the housing crisis, there is an opportunity to improve the life chances of Scotland's people, including some of the poorest and most vulnerable. Can the Minister then perhaps provide information in light of these expert opinions, what more it will do to help the most vulnerable obtain housing? Minister. The Scottish Government will work, as we have our joint delivery plan, uh, to deliver housing in Scotland with all stakeholders in the sector. And a key aim of that plan is to provide more housing and see housing delivered across all tenures in Scotland. And we will work to achieve that. Our officials are working tirelessly as well to look at more innovative ways of using the, the finances that we do get, the, the reducing finances that we do get from the UK government to ensure that we can stretch them further. We will continue to build social housing and housing across all tenures. Um, we will continue to do that. It is a priority for this government. And we, what we have said, we have delivered in the past parliament and any targets we set in the future parliament will also deliver. 
Uh, members will wish to note that I do have some time in hand over the whole of the afternoon, so I intend to allow the session to continue uh, to allow as many members to have an opportunity to ask questions of the ministers. Um, but can I also remind members that I really, truly would appreciate it if you would keep your questions brief. Uh, Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, last week, the Minister, during, sorry, two weeks ago during Labour's debate on housing, the Minister steadfastly refused to accept the description of our housing supply situation in Scotland by the Commission on Housing and Wellbeing as a crisis. Does she accept the figure of 12,000 social houses a year as an accurate assessment of current need in Scotland for social housing? Does she accept that figure? Minister. Um, what I said in my initial, initial response is that we will, of course, consider the findings of this report and look at them uh, very seriously. And I also said that a target of 6,000 affordable homes is, the, is not our ambition. Our ambition is to build more homes than that, uh, affordable homes, homes uh, for social rent as well, and we'll continue to do that. We have delivered 19% more than any other administration, and we'll continue to work to deliver even more uh, and above, above that. Alex John. Against the need uh, defined in the question, the National Housing Trust can only be judged as a failure. Will the Minister at this point give a commitment to return to the idea of the National Housing Trust and bring forward alternative proposals for a new vehicle which will facilitate private investment in affordable housing? Minister. At this stage, I am certainly not going to give a commitment to something that uh, Alec Johnson has mentioned for the first time that I can, I can recollect, and certainly not anything he's brought to me before. But what I, can, what I can say to him is we are working with the sector, with investors, with lenders across the sector to attract a private investment into the housing sector, and we continue to do that. And we're open. We've, we've had discussions with many groups, many investors, and willing to uh, listen to any ideas and if Alex Johnson has got any uh, idea that he feels that we should be taken forward, then I suggest he, he brings it to us. Patrick Harv. Thank you. What action is the Scottish Government taking to enable local authorities to acquire land for housing at a more reasonable price? And does the Minister accept the basic principle that government targets uh, ought to be determined by the level of need that exists? Minister. I would say that, yes, we, we're looking at needs, and that's why we have our, our housing uh, needs and demand assessments, because we have to look, and local authorities um, advise us on the, the demand in their local authority area. So, yes, we do look at that demand, and we also have recently launched, the Cabinet Secretary launched the planning review, which is looking at the delivery of housing and the infrastructure to ensure that it's not just a process, it's about effective and efficient delivery of the housing programmes uh, that come forward. So we're looking at those issues as well. Question number three, Graham Pearson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure the people in Cumnock are not disadvantaged by the decision to close the Cumnock campus of Air College. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. President officer, this news is disappointing. I understand that the decision by Ayrshire College to close the Cumnock, Council, uh, Cumnock campus uh, was due to a fall in student numbers, with students choosing to attend uh, the other campuses, including the recently refurbished Ayr campus. Uh, the college advise, however, that they will continue to work with its partners and will run short courses at locations across the area to help people develop employability skills. Uh, looking ahead, the new £53 million campus in Kilmarnock, uh, due to open next year, will provide further opportunities in state-of-the-art facilities for learners across the region. Graham Pearson. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. She will understand the difficulties faced by those who live in the Cumnock area. It is a challenged area through unemployment and, and other past uh, uh, upsets. Uh, women's access is an important ax, uh, um, uh, issue for the Government. And the current announcement has been a great shock to the people of Cumnock not only in terms of its impact on the economy, but particularly in terms of access to opportunity. Uh, will she take any steps to ensure that what can be done for this area will be done in educational terms? Cabinet Secretary. 
presiding officer, it is uh, imperative uh, that the college uh, continues to work with the community to reassure the community and to convince the community that despite the closure uh, of the Cumnock campus, that nonetheless the college remains committed to learning opportunities uh, in the area. Uh, Mr Pearson might be interested to note that the Scottish Funding Council's outcome agreement uh, guidance sets out expectations uh, that colleges will provide a wide range of FE provision uh, in locations across regions, uh, making it more uh, accessible to students. Uh, in my original answer, I stated uh, that the College does indeed intend to work with local partners uh, to identify alternative venues for the two part-time courses uh, currently uh, being offered and that they will also uh, have to work with the Student Association to uh, support students uh, through the transition uh, to uh, a new uh, location as well. Ian Pearson. Uh, again, thank you for that response. The Cabinet Secretary will know the expense that is incurred in travelling distances for courses. Uh, there is that concern in the local area about the additional cost to students. There is also a perception in the area that courses have been transferred to these other campus sites. And as a result, the campus at Cumnock has been to some extent disadvantaged. At the same time, discussions were ongoing about creche facilities in Ayr and Kilmarnock and the future of these facilities, and they have further concerned local constituents about access to education, and I hope she will take further interest in these matters. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, of course I will continue to take uh, an ongoing interest uh, in these uh, matters, and I appreciate the tone and tenor of Mr Pearson's con contribution today. He may be interested to note that uh, students who live over two miles from their college uh, are eligible to apply for assistance uh, with travel costs. And he also uh, raises the issue um, of the, the, the two nursery uh, closures as well, the nurseries at the Ayr and uh, Kilwinning uh, campus. Um, again, you know, this is a decision uh, for Ayr College to take. The college uh, states that despite its endeavours to increase demand uh, for the nurseries, uh, nonetheless that these nurseries were struggling uh, to break even and that currently there are 37 children uh, using the facilities uh, to a cost to the college uh, of £400,000. Uh, but certainly I will continue in my inquiries along with uh, local members to uh, test uh, the nature of information that comes our way. Adam Ingram. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary understand my concerns about the College's lack of consultation with the local community, community over this decision? The lack of transparency and openness compares unfavourably to, for example, the protocols for school closure proposals. What discussions have there been between the Scottish Government and Ayrshire College? And can she provide reassurance to the Cumnock community about the impact on the level and quality of college provision for my constituents? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I share some of Mr Ingram's concerns. It is important to state uh, firmly that consultation should never be seen as a, an added extra. It has to be part of the way in which uh, government and public services uh, conduct themselves. Uh, I am, of course, uh, aware of the particular uh, challenges uh, that affect the local community of Cumnock, not least, as mentioned by others, its comparative uh, isolation and long-standing uh, high levels of unemployment. Uh, so I do want to uh, reiterate my disappointment at this decision uh, to Mr Ingram and uh, other members who have an interest in this and that we will certainly continue to uh, work together to ensure that the College uh, mitigates uh, any uh, impact. Um, can I also say to Mr uh, Ingram that my officials have sought reassurances from the College that plans uh, are in place to continue to support and enable uh, the aspirations of local residents uh, that they have to, to learn and study. Uh, for students currently attending the Cumnock campus, uh, the College is, uh, as I said earlier, identifying an alternative location for delivery uh, with their other uh, local partners. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 
14448 in the name of Derek Mackay on empowering